My name is Wendy Cho and I'm Actera's Communications and Outreach Manager. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to our first climate lecture of the season, which this year is a collaboration between Actera and the Forum at Rancho San Antonio. We started planning this uh, event many months ago uh, where the Actera where Actera and the Forum decided to pull forces on a joint series on climate change. And so we're so thrilled that this has finally taken shape. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to introduce everyone to Jim Liskovec from the Forum. So he can tell us a little bit more about this lovely place. Um, this is a picture of Jim doing what he loves to do, which is to be out in nature photographing its beauty. He's a seasoned amateur photographer, an avid birder, a traveler with his partner, Sue, uh, an environmentalist, and first and foremost, he is a citizen who is very deeply concerned about climate change and really willing to do work to get the word out to others. So with that, take it away, Jim. You might have to um, unmute yourself. Thank you, Wendy. Greetings, everyone. My name is Jim Liskovic. And my wife Sue and I live at the Forum at Rancho San Antonio in Cupertino, California. The Forum is a is a life care uh, life plan retirement community on 54 acres, adjacent to a 4,000 acre open space preserve. There are over 500 forum members, the majority in independent living, the others in assisted living, skilled nursing, or memory care. The forum is owned by the residents and operated by a management company under the direction of a board of resident directors. The open space present affords residents many opportunities for activities such as hiking, birding, and photography. Sue and I are engaged with a small group of residents here that focuses on making the forum a more sustainable place to live. The group focuses uh, addresses issues such as water, food, and energy. Again, my name is Wendy Cho. I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager at Actera. And to give everyone a quick introduction, uh, we are a Bay Area 501c3 organization whose mission is bringing people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. We have four strategic pillars. Um, the first is beneficial electrification for all, which is about accelerating our transition to clean electric buildings and transportation. We have our pillar, Healthy Plate, Healthy Planet, which centers a plant forward lifestyle and supports reducing food waste, both of which are extremely important climate change factors. We have a pillar for education and youth, which is extremely important when we think about empowering communities and young people to take action on climate solutions. And we have a pillar for workplace sustainability. Um, Actera provides resources and knowledge sharing to green teams in local businesses and organizations in the Bay Area through our Green Team Network. And another program folded into this pillar is our long running business environmental awards program. Um, one of our major foundations to our work is equity and that's represented um, throughout all of our programming. And especially um, we found that we have two very successful approaches to our work. The first is that there's a lot of low hanging fruit when it comes to individual behavior and behavior change. So this is the types of choices we make every day. And we also know that there's a lot of progress we can make by influencing decision makers and policy makers. So we also apply policy advocacy as one of our strategies. So I invite you to learn more about these pillars at actera.org. Tonight's event is part of Actera's education pillar. And in addition to the public lecture series, we have two other programs. Uh, Youth Be the Change is a really exciting program we've launched that is an educational climate change curriculum for middle schoolers. The emphasis is on learning about climate change impacts globally and locally, but also solutions that make sense uh, for, for locally. And we also have a program that involves community college students and high school students in becoming advocates for climate-friendly policies. 
by attending city council meetings and submitting public comments. That program is called the Actera Student Ambassadors Program or ASAP. And here's some upcoming events that you can look forward to from Actera. If you're a fan of electric vehicles or curious to learn more, please join us for our upcoming event next Wednesday, the 23rd. It's called New Year's Revolution Drive Electric in 2022. That's at 7 p.m. And our biggest event of the year is coming up on March 25th, which is Promise to Our Planet, a climate action benefit. Um, we have some great invited guests. We have breakout sessions where you'll be inspired to take action. And we will also be celebrating award winners um, from the Bay Area. This event begins at 6 p.m. on the 25th with a networking session beginning at 5 p.m. Pacific. And of course, we have two more amazing climate lectures coming up with uh, two great scientists as part of the Ectera Forum climate lecture series where we're looking at the connections between climate, drought, and fire. First up, we have Katrin Chappelle, who is Associate Director of the California Water Program at the Nature Conservancy, and she'll be speaking March 30th. And we have Kristen Scheib, uh, who is Lead Forest Scientist at the Nature Conservancy in California, and she'll be speaking April 27th. Uh, and some thank yous to our wonderful series underwriters, um, Marion Clinton Gilliland, and Armand and Eileon Nukermans, thank you so much for your generosity. And we have two series sponsors to thank as well, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the Foster um, Wilderness uh, Foundation, both lovely organizations. And finally, uh, we hope that the programming today inspires you. And if you are so moved, we would love to have your support um, to help keep our events free for the general public. So thank you so much for your consideration. And let me introduce today's featured speaker. We're so fortunate to have Dr. Pablo Ortiz Partida with us. He is a bilingual climate and water scientist with uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists. Pablo works on developing strategies for vulnerable sectors and populations in California to cope with and adapt to the current and projected impacts of climate change, particularly related to water impacts. He holds a PhD in hydrology and water resources management and carries out primary analysis on how climate change is impacting key sectors and populations, especially with regards to changes in precipitation and water supply. So let me just add you here. So with that, without further ado, uh, take it away, Dr. Pablo Ortiz Partida. Thank you. Thank you. And I will be sharing my screen now. Can you see this? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm super happy to be here. And what I hope to show you today is that climate change is fundamentally transforming how, when, and where California gets water, and that those changes have profound implications for the state, for the environment, and therefore for us. And then with that comes a call to action to all of us to be conscious about the ways that we live and to let our representatives know that we want to do everything we can to conserve the environment in California. And I also, want you to I, I also want to show you that the most and the first affected are going to be those that are the most vulnerable among us. And I'm sure that the idea that California's climate and the climate of the entire world is changing is not a surprise to anyone in this like virtual room that we have right now. And as we keep increasing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet becomes hotter. Yeah. Here's some <laughs> background in nice. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, as we keep increasing the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet becomes hotter, and this includes surface and water temperatures, and this modifies the climate as we know it. And what this slide shows is the global temperature change relative to pre-industrial levels, which is roughly the period from 1850 to 1900. So this is basically how it was about 130 years ago. Then about 70 years ago, starting to get a little bit hotter, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 
15 years ago. And this is basically now. And it's actually worse because this is already four years old and it's only getting hotter. So 2020 tied with 2016 as the hottest year on record. And last year, 2021 was the sixth hottest year on record. So the question is, what does climate change mean for our water resources? And what does it mean for California? And in particular, my main interest is, what does it mean for the most vulnerable communities among us? So first, to start getting into California water systems, just really fast, California has a super complex water system. The squares in this map represent more than 1,000 300 federal, state, and local surface reservoirs across California that captures the precipitation, the snow melt, the runoff, and then the color lines represent thousands of miles of canals, rivers, streams, and pipes that bring water to California, almost 40 million residents, 10 million acres of irrigated agriculture, and thriving industries. And then the state also has about 515 groundwater basins that supplies additional water, um, particularly during the dry periods. So it acts as a vital buffer during these dry periods. And climate change is threatening to break California's water system altogether and create new vulnerabilities for which our infrastructure and our instit institutions are unprepared. And then these breaks means more impactful droughts and floods, damage to infrastructure and other impacts that ultimately um, increases our water crisis. Now, from many studies, we know that climate change is transforming, again, how, when, and where California gets water. And yet, multiple water agencies um, continue to make decisions based on the past, often because climate change is seen as too uncertain, too distant, or too difficult to integrate into decision-making. And I'll tell you a little bit of where that is coming from. And the next three slides are the most complex that I have in my presentation. So bear with me for a couple of minutes. Um, there is data from 10, 10 climate global climate models or general circulation models that we use in California. And then these are numerical models that represent the physical processes in our atmosphere, in our oceans, and in the land surface. And these are the most advanced tools currently available to simulating the response of global climate systems to the increase of greenhouse gases concentrations. So from these 10 models, there are many variables relevant to water management, but arguably the most important or the most relevant are temperature and precipitation. And this is because from these variables, we can calculate or derive many other metrics that are relevant to water management. So now if we look at projections of temperatures across these 10 models, each line, each color line representing a different model, uh, which is why I'm showing this graph, um, they universally agree that annual maximum temperatures, annual average maximum temperatures are increasing. And then climate model projections show that annual average maximum temperatures could warm by another 10 degrees by the end of the century, depending on the choices that we make about how much to keep emitting. And then actually, uh, annual average temperatures in the state have already warmed by one degree Fahrenheit, and in some parts of the state, they have already warmed by two degrees Fahrenheit. So the perceived uncertainty for water resources comes mainly from projections of precipitation. And precipitation is a more complex process, and if we look at the annual average precipitation across all these 10 models, then it seems that these projections are all over the place. This last uh, year that I'm showing here, because it's, I know it's very small, is the year 2100. So about um, 80 years from now. And so it looks like it's all over the place. And by that, I mean that, I mean that some models project more precipitation, some project less precipitation. And overall, if we average them together, then there are no meaningful changes in terms of volume. 
And then this uncertainty has been used as some sort of an excuse to avoid integrating climate change, for example, by some local agencies in, um, for example, the groundwater sustainability plans for those of you familiar with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So to recap, here are both of the charts together. Again, temperature has a very clear trend upwards, but precipitation, not so much. But we are only looking at a couple of metrics, and there are many other metrics that are as relevant or even more relevant than annual average precipitation for water management. And the question is, which are these metrics and how do climate models agree on those metrics? And this is part of the research that we did at the Journal of Concern Scientists in collaboration with other climate scientists. So the questions that we ask are, how much more precipitation is it going to come, to come as rain versus snow? Or how much more of our snowpack is going to be reduced with the higher temperatures? Also, are there going to be more days of warm rain, warm rain over snow? basically making the risk of flooding even higher? Or how much more the wet season is going to be compressed in the already wet winter months that we have in California? How is the intensity of the extreme events going to change? How the higher temperatures are going to dry out soils and vegetation and increase water demands? Or how much it will affect the big swings between wet years and dry years that can lead to big infrastructure failures or impacts like what we saw on Oroville Reservoir in 2017. So using those same data from those same tame climate models, we put some numbers on the metrics and I'm going to show you a few of the results that hopefully will make you think about the importance of incorporating this into water plan. So, Global climate models agree on yearly precipitation, on more yearly precipitation arriving as rain rather than snow. This is the blue shades of the left and a drastic decline on snowpack, or the orange shades on the right. And basically the ratio of rainfall to snowfall is projected to increase statewide and almost double in the high Sierras with almost a complete snowpack loss at the lower elevations statewide within the next 80 years. So this essentially eliminates this natural uh, snowpack storage towards the end of the century if we continue at the current rates of emissions of heat trapping gases. And snowpack storage is currently vital for California because it melts during the spring, it fills our reservoirs, and then we use that water later for our extensive agriculture. And this is basically a visual representation. And unfortunately, those landscapes in the right will be more and more common. What about regarding the shift in intensity and seasonality of precipitation? Well, the proportion of yearly precipitation that arrives in the most extreme events is projected to increase by more than 50% across Central California. And these types of events increase the risk of floods and mudslides and make precipitation harder to store and to manage in our reservoirs. Also, the proportion of yearly precipitation that falls in the already wet winter months, which is roughly from November to March, is projected to increase statewide by five to six percent and by up to 20 percent in certain in certain places. So this requires greater water storage in a shorter time span and creates a longer and more intense dry, dry season. And this is also connected to making the wildfire season longer. Another metric that I'm not showing here is the increase in swings between the um, um, between extreme years. So the very dry, very dry years and the very wet years. And the likelihood of very wet and very dry years is projected to increase by doubling or even tripling, tripling in some parts of the state. And these swings are important because are, <laughs> are damaging because they contribute to fatal mudslides, unexpected wildfire behavior and damage to water infrastructure. So again, extremes are going to become more extremes. And this is something that we have already been seeing. And we will need to change the operation of, of our water infrastructure. 
This is Oroville Reservoir during the drought in 2016. And then a year later, on 2017, one, one very wet year, and nearly 200 people had to be evacuated because there was there a risk for the reservoir to break and completely flood cities downstream. And now we are in another drought. So this is Oroville last summer, July 2020. It got even worse before it got better after the rains that we had in October last year. And then if you read the news, you probably saw one of these headlines on either Monday, yesterday, or, or even today, no? And basically a study from UCLA and Columbia University found that the last 22 years have been the driest 22-year um, period in the Western United States in at least 1,200 years. And it says at least, because that's how far the reconstructed, the reconstructed data goes. So it could actually be worse. These graphs show the drought conditions in the Western United States during this 22 year period, starting here in the left in the year 2000 and ending um, roughly about now in 2022. And despite some wet years that we had, for example, in 2005, 2010, 2017, the soils have been unable to recover from the soil moisture deficit since the year 2000. And this is what it is called a mega drought, which is a dry period lasting in the order of decades. And part of why the study is making so many headlines is that the researchers also calculated that about 42%, 42% of this mega drought can be attributed to human climate change. 42% of the mega drought that we are having since the year 2000 can be attributed to human caused climate change. And as you can also see in this graph, dry periods are coming at a rate that doesn't allow us to recover. So we are becoming more vulnerable and less resilient against droughts. So now, Let's talk about drought impacts and in relation to the different colors that we are seeing here uh, so that we have a sense of, of the differences. And I'm going to only focus on the red and the darker red, which are the, the most important ones. So the bright red means extreme drought. And extreme drought translates into livestock at risk due to little pasture, damage to fruit trees and even some orchards needs to be removed, water supply deficits that leads to new well drilling, um, and there is over extraction of ground water, particularly uh, that affects eventually disadvantaged communities because aquifer levels decrease and we have private and community wells uh, going dry. There is also more fuel so fire seasons become longer and fires more intense. It even impacts our recreational activities such as skiing, boating, or kayaking. Ecosystems are also damaged and there is little native food available for wild animals. And then hydropower is also reduced and hydropower is restricted, which by the way, take us back to using more fossil fuel um, fossil fuels to produce energy and emitting more heat trapping gas, uh, more heat trapping gases, basically creating this feedback loop, loop with climate change. And then we have the exceptional drought category. And here, <laughs> basically exacerbating all of the things above, but plus agricultural yields are low, some fields are left fallow, and more orchards needs to be removed fire season becomes very costly. Um, there is the smoke and the dry dust that decreases our air quality and basically affects our, affects our health. There is also water in rivers becomes very low, temperatures are higher, higher, and it leads to increase in fish mortality. Also, agriculture unemployment is high, surface water um, is depleted, more wells go dry, 
water shortages are widespread and water quality decrease as, contam as contaminants get concentrated. Now, I'm going to change gears and lower the scale to try to answer what do, what do these changes mean for the most vulnerable communities? And I will start here with a couple of stories very close to my heart. This is the story of Jose Ornelas. And I met Jose while I was doing some interviews to community members and community leaders with some other researchers at UC Merced. And it was already a bit after sunset and Jose had this smile that day. His wife and his daughter were also there. And Jose graduated, graduated from Fresno State. He graduated from Fresno State and then he went back to his community to put a business and help improve his community, the city of San Joaquin. That day was our first interview. So I was a little bit nervous doing this interview with him. And while we were preparing for the interview, Jose showed us a couple of videos that I'm going to show in a moment of water coming out from the faucets in some of the homes in his community. And he mentioned that the majority of his community was from Latinx or Hispanic origin. The median household in his community makes about $20,000 a year and that the majority were farm workers. He also said, well, the community has about 500 houses, but like 600 families. And that is because sometimes two, three or more families needs to live in the same house to be able to afford. It. So here are those, those videos. And let me try to, uh, yeah. So here are those videos. So this is how sometimes the water come out in some of these communities. And another problem is that they don't always know when the water is going to come out like this. So sometimes they put a washing machine and their clothes come over the stain, or they want to take a fast shower in the morning before going to work. And then they need to wait for 15, 20 minutes for the water to clear up. This water has high concentrations of sediments and manganese and chronic ingestion of manganese has been linked to memory problems, anxiety and insomnia. So during the interview, and after talking about this water, we wanted to have some verbal confirmation that clean water availability was the main problem of this community. So we asked Jose, hey Jose, what is the worst environmental problem in your community? And to our surprise, he said, our biggest problem is the air quality. And then after watching us, and seeing our expression, he added, because clean water is expensive, but at least we can buy it. And then Jose was a leader in his community. He became part of the city council. He was afraid of the water, but even more afraid of the air. And Jose died from COVID in July, 2020. Maybe that bad air um, was partially responsible for it. Also, as Jose mentioned, there are many farmer workers in this community. So can you just imagine like how frustrating it may be for some people working in these communities, working in the fields, irrigating with clean water coming down from the Sierras, watching sometimes flooded almond fields, and then go back and, having, and not having clean water to drink. I'm going to tell you one more story, which is about La Señora Reina. And La Señora Reina immigrated from El Salvador when she was young. Her five children were born in the United States. She is now retired and lives in an unincorporated community of about 300 houses very close to the city of Tulay. The water of her community used to be supplied from a well, and the water was contaminated with pesticides and arsenic. 
pesticides and arsenic are linked to cancers, birth defects, and cardiovascular diseases. The main economic activity, as you can probably imagine looking at, at this picture, is agriculture. So that means that people need to work in the very farms that are contaminating their water and the farms that often produce the food that they cannot even uh, afford to pay. La Señora Reina is a community leader that advocated to connect the water system of her community to the water system of, this, of the nearest city. And a couple of years ago, I'm super happy to say that she succeeded. And now the water system of her community is connected to the city of Tulare. And she is now fighting for the community to be able to also connect or to have a sewage system. And these are only two stories of two communities. And there are hundreds of communities like this in California, not only in the Central Valley. Some share similar problems and some very different. Some people living in communities in the valley are paying more per unit of water than people living in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and San Diego. And it's often water that they cannot even drink. California is the richest state in the richest country of the world. And there are close to 1 million people with all reliable access to drinking water supply. This is how some of the frontline communities look like. Some are bigger, some are smaller, many are surrounded by agriculture. And climate change is exacerbating conditions that lead, among other things, to drought and wildfires that further threaten people living in these communities. Higher temperatures increase the risk of heat stroke and other direct effects on people, particularly for outdoor, outdoor workers, many of which tend to have low income jobs like farm workers. Also higher temperatures represent a risk for families who cannot, um, who either don't have air conditioner or who cannot afford to pay for the electricity bill. Higher temperatures dry out soil and vegetation and enhancing conditions for wildfires that lead to heavy smoke and then essential but sometimes invisible workers need to keep harvesting over food. Higher temperatures also increase evapotranspiration, potentially increasing water demands, mainly from agriculture. Um, and this could mean that agriculture would depend even more heavily on groundwater, furthering lo uh, further lowering groundwater levels that again, mostly affect people with less resources and reduce their water access and degrades some of their water quality. We actually don't need to wait for climate change to see that. In one side, because climate change is already here, because, but in other side, because many of these inequities were already happening and have been happening for the past 100 years. So we have seen it many times already. During this drought that started in 2020, there have been over a thousand reports of wells going dry or with increased concentration of pollutants, particularly in disadvantaged communities. There are often other effects related to water quality that occur due to physicochemical process triggered by overpumping. So in short, overpumping increases concentrations of naturally occurring arsenic. Um, coming out from some layers of clay that are in the groundwater. So the arsenic may be natural um, on some of these areas, but overpumping is certainly not. And as we get more droughts, we will likely see more overpumping and therefore worse water quality. Many people in the San Joaquin Valley depend on bottled water for drinking. And this of course represents an extra expense. Some people need to go to their neighbor and to their neighbor's house who may have a deeper well or whose water, or, or whose water hasn't been contaminated. Or others may need to pay for an interim water tank to bring some water to their homes. In many cases, community members need to use bottled water also for cooking. And we have talked to people that said that they have intense headaches whenever they drink the water. 
and that's something uh, and that sometimes they get rashes in their skin after taking a shower also by the way have, have you carried one of those um <laughs> well one of those things those are very heavy to move as we get more precipitation in terms of rain and less as snow, it means that we will have more water, more water runoff in less amount of time and potentially creating more floods. And floods in communities also hit different because even a little bit of rain can create flooding areas that make it difficult to cross the street or to go to school or to get to the bus. It even makes it hard just to get out of home. So by now, I hope that some of you are wondering, what can you do? And first of all, I would say, talk about it. Help spread the world. The more people know about this, the higher it is to hide, and the more people will feel motivated to get involved. Also, advocate for climate action and water justice. And there are many ways in which you could do that. And here are only two simple ones. If money is an issue, what you can do is you can do something really simple, like becoming part of the newsletters of organization that fights for equity and justice, uh, because this organization often shares ways to get involved or they write letters to the governor or other representatives or agencies, and then you can sign onto these letters to show some support. If money is less of an issue, here are some options for you of groups to donate. Of course, Acterra to have more events like this or to the Union of Constant Scientists so Acterra can invite more scientists like me and other groups, for example, the Community Water Center, it's amazing self-help enterprises, the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, Green Latinos or a nonprofit also called Forvenir, which was funded by some students in UC Merced. Then in, in this era of division, I invite you to advocate for, for unity and to show patience and love to people whose understanding of the world is different from us. So another advice is to do the exercise of thinking about how climate change is affecting you personally. And if after making the exercise, you still don't realize how climate change is already affecting you, but you recognize that it may affect you in the future, then advocate for your future by advocating for the present of others, because this is something already happening to many people, not only of California, but of course, across the world. So write about it, write about how climate change is affecting you, share it with others and help create this larger movement. Movement, And the last thing that I want to share um, is think about your reasons for hope and for action. Think about your reasons for hope and for action. And in my case, my reasons for hope are people like you, the people interested enough to stay until this part of the presentation. And I also get hope from my family, from my partner, from my friends, my colleagues at the Union of Concerned Scientists, the youth with hunger for change, and the many community leaders in the front lines of climate change fighting for equity. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Pablo, for sharing those wonderful, it was, uh, the slides were so informative, but also just ending on that very personal note uh, was very moving. And I'm so glad that you are giving people ways to get involved instead of just leaving everyone feeling very helpless. So thank you so much. Uh, we've now reached the part of the uh, program where if you have a question, uh, you're welcome to submit it. So there's two ways to go about doing this. If you are on Zoom with us, you can click the Q&A tab and start typing your question in. 
And you can also upvote other people's questions so we know which ones are the most important to ask. If you are tuning in via channel 8, uh, if you're living at the forum, you can call this number 650-740-1996. That's 650-740-1996 and have your questions relayed to the moderator. Um, and while people are thinking about their questions, I just wanted to put in two more little notes about things that we have going on uh, at Actera. One of them is called Homegrown Bay Area, and it's a focus on getting our uh, Bay Area food system more functional, more sustainable, more just, and more um, healthy for all. So we invite you to, to check out this website, actera.org slash homegrown. Um, if you're interested in food, which of course includes the status of farm workers and the conditions um, that they are working under. And if you are inspired to uh, work on climate action further, there's a really convenient mobile app that we are using and recommending. It's called Climate Action Now. Uh, you can find it anywhere that you get apps. And if you sign up, you can uh, do things like send tweets to elected officials, you can sign petitions, uh, you can do a lot of different things uh, just from your phone, which is really, really, really helpful. Um, so in terms of starting off on the questions, uh, Pablo, I was wondering if you could explain, since your, one of your slides talked about the community water center as a place where people can get involved, um, can you describe what that is, the Community Water Center, and, and what is its role in this um, process of, of enabling people to have clean water? Yes, the Community Water Center is a nonprofit organization, a grassroots community organization, and they have been advocating and fighting for bringing clean water to, to people in many of these communities. So these are one of the organizations that are really on the ground and their main focus and mission is advocating for, for these communities and is formed by, the, by some of the community leaders themselves. Great, I see. So that is a San Joaquin Valley based organization or is it California based or national? It originated in the San Joaquin Valley, but it has been expanding a little bit. I think now they have an office in, in Visalia and another office in the Salinas Valley. Great, thank you. Uh, so one question we have here uh, from Anne, uh, she actually wants to know if you're able to uh, present to other communities as a guest speaker on Zoom. So that's great. We already have booked your next appointment for you. Um, but maybe if, if you would not mind sharing your uh, contact information with folks, we could put that into the chat. If you prefer us not to do yeah, that, Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I can put it on the chat right now. and. Yes, happy to talk um, in other spaces and we can coordinate outside here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and another question we have uh, from Anne as well. How can we ensure that our water agencies here in California are planning effectively for the future? I think what she is implying is, you know, planning with climate change and drought in mind. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yes, it depends on the water agency, you know, but some effective ways is participating on their public meetings and then kind of making sure put some pressure on them to ask the hard questions to them, no? Are they planning for climate change? How are they planning? Which kind of climate change projections they are considering? And try to really get, a, there are different water agencies, so it's very different. Um, of course, we have also the Department of Water Resources, which is basically the state, agency with that with this mandate but because water management in california is so fragmented and we have so many different literary water agencies um, it really depends on on each of them i see thank you and do some of these agencies have official public comment channels or is it up to individuals to try to make contact with folks great question and i will say i honestly don't know that okay that's fine We'll look that up. Um, another question has come in from Eric. Uh, how should GSAs incorporate climate change data to best manage groundwater aquifers for a changing climate? It's a very similar question, I guess, as, as the previous one about how 
is water management going to be informed by climate change data? Mm -hmm. So the GSAs are the groundwater sustainability agencies for context for everyone else. And these are local agencies that were formed with the mandate to develop a, what is called a groundwater sustainability plan in which they need to incorporate how they are planning to reach groundwater sustainability by the year 2040. So the ways in, and, and I, I'm part of a group that has been reviewing some of the these groundwater sustainability plans and some of the um, deficiencies that we have been seeing or a trend is that many of these groundwater sustainability plans are not including what is called extreme scenarios, extreme climate change scenarios, which could be like a very dry and hot future or a very um, cool and, and, and wet future to kind of try to address this range of uncertainty from climate change. So uh, the ways to get involved into this to answer, to finish, to answer the question. Uh, oh, I lost the question now. Well, it went away to our answers. Oh, I'm sorry. It was basically oh, it's fine. So, how the uh, data informs the Incorporate GSAs. climate change data. Basically incorporate this, this data that is available about the extreme events. And also in some cases, as, as we advance no, in, in um, how complex we integrate climate change, integrate not only these average metrics or like the ones that I was mentioning, like annual average precipitation and annual average temperatures, but also incorporate interannual metrics and intra-annual metrics to plan for this um, broad range of, of climate change scenarios that we have. Thank you. Um, one question that occurred to me uh, while you were talking about uncertainty is you had mentioned the complete loss of snowpack in the Sierras within 80 years. Um, do you know what the sort of uncertainty window is around that prediction and how, how certain is it? Well, it's increasingly certain. It's something that we have already observed. Now, as temperatures increase, then the ratio of rainfall versus snow changes having more precipitation in terms of rainfall and then that translates to having less snowpack and also higher temperatures also influence how fast the, the snow melts um, so it will be a matter of keep seeing what are the trends coming um, in the coming years as temperatures increase great thank you um, and we had one question from the audience about the connection between increasing temperature and uh, precipitation change, which I gathered from your slide was a very noisy relationship. Um, the person's asking, how does temperature reduce precipitation? But I'm not sure that that's actually what you were saying. I think you were showing that there was quite a bit of noise in that graph, that there wasn't a very simple relationship between increasing temperature and changes in precipitation. Can you elaborate? Exactly. There, there's not a clear um, connection no, between this increase in temperature and reduced precipitation. And this is because it's very complex. Like as, as the atmosphere warms, the atmosphere can have, can actually hold more, more water. Um, and then this makes many interactions at the, in the sense of climate very complex. But the important part to keep from here is that even regardless of changes of precipitation, what have, what is going to happen, and it's already happening, is that temperatures alone can increase evapotranspiration rates. And this basically means increasing water demands. So even if we continue getting the same amount of precipitation, water becomes less available as it evaporates more and as water demands increases for agriculture, for the cities, and for every basically other use. Right. And a related question that is coming in from an audience member, the what is the role that the state government might play or maybe should play in this sort of tension in water rights? So we have a tension in the different users of water, urban users, the cities, and the agricultural use of water. Um, and do you have any thoughts on the role of government in trying to kind of mediate this tension? Yeah, it's a super complex topic, no? And there are some experts that will be able to talk uh, more about it than me. 
my personal opinion is that there needs to be some way to kind of update some of these water rights because some of the water rights have been there for over a hundred years and there was an over allocation of some of these water rights. So rivers have a certain amount of volume. Some of those water rights were divided when there was a wet period. And then as we progress and we had more data, we realized that in many cases, there is not that amount of water anymore. Um, there is also the problem that water rights are only for surface water, at least in, in California. And we haven't been regulating groundwater until this piece of legislation, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act came in 2014. And, and that's a little bit of what I was talking about with the uh, groundwater sustainability agencies and groundwater sustainability plans. But that's a process uh, that will last at least until 2040. So really we need to check how can we start having the water rights, not only for surface water, but also for groundwater because water is connected. Water from the surface goes to the ground, and then we take it out and it becomes part of this water cycle. Um, let me reread the question to see if rationalize traditional water rights. So yes, also a lot of the water right holders are very powerful entities and with a lot of uh, lobbying power in, in our state. So the other part of the water rights that it's probably not how this question was crafted, but it's the human right to water. And this is a law that came out in 2012 in California, the California Human Right to Water. And despite it being for already 10 years, we still have so many people without reliable access to drinking water supply. So really, we need to get at the, the water rights uh, right to, to fix this problem. Great. Um, here's a question uh, going back to the issue of how we audience members can help communities in the valley to have clean water. So I think you mentioned a few strategies, um, including helping other organizations. Um, what, what do you think about something like uh, storage and could people have more rain barrels or are there other things that we could do to create more infrastructure for clean water? Yes, part of it is, um... There are different ways, no? depending on how people like to participate and to get involved. Um, one easy way that I mentioned was supporting some of the organizations that are already doing this work. And the other part is, um, I mentioned this part of infrastructure that you mentioned, no? and I will say infrastructure, yes, of course, in the side of, um, maybe some new pipes and these connections from nearby cities to the communities. But we really need to start thinking in infrastructure that is what is called green infrastructure, which is no more these huge uh, concrete reservoirs because we already use the, the best spaces in California uh, for big reservoirs. So the fact that we have a bigger reservoir don't necessarily mean that we can that, that there is that water available to, to put it there. So instead of thinking about those big concrete projects, we need to start thinking about how to replenish our aquifers because aquifers have way more holding capacity than whatever reservoir we can put upstream and our reservoirs or, and our aquifers have been depleting and depleting. So how can we put that water that we need to store, but in, places that are natural and that will not only bring the benefits of water availability and creating this buffer, particularly during dry periods, but would also help with ecosystems that depends on this groundwater that will also help to replenish some of that surface water and basically overall have multiple benefits from, from these like uh, green infrastructure projects that can also be thought as protecting our forest and our headwaters, um, particularly in the Sierra Nevada. That's great. It's so nice to think about solutions that have multiple wins that aren't just solving one problem, but are good for m many reasons. So that's great. Uh, there's a, a very broad question um, coming in about how, I'll kind of re reframe it, but this question from John is, 
Um, how do we impress upon our leaders the urgency of the climate crisis and the need for bold action and policy to create a clean energy infrastructure? I guess what he's saying is, you know, we're just making this problem worse the more greenhouse gases we're pumping out to, to, to cause more climate change. So I'm curious if you see these stories from the Central Valley and with water quality and shortage and scarcity, is that one way to get through to um, elected leaders about the consequences of climate change? That's one way. The other way is um, call them, send, send them an email, send them a letter. Tell them that this is an important topic for you. Uh, as we know, most of our leaders really care about the, the votes, no? So if more people talks about it, if more people um, cares about this, then these our leaders and these policy actions will kind of gravitate toward this center of attention from, from all of us. Thank you. Uh, and another question from Shalom. They are curious, what is the state of California doing towards climate adaptability? I guess she means, or he or she means adaptation. That's a big question. Yeah, this is in, in different aspects. No, there are some uh, funding, not only at the state level, but also at the federal level that is for communities to develop adaptation projects and communities that can apply to this funding for different projects that will serve their communities. Mm -hmm. the, the only, mm, I, I would say problem for lack of a better word coming to my brain right now, but the only difficulty or challenge is that the most vulnerable communities often don't have the technical capacity, the resources, the technical knowledge to apply for this kind of funding. So uh, the state really needs to get creative on how to reach these most vulnerable communities and really see how they can support um, for them to either apply this funding or give the funding directly without even needing an application to the most to, to some communities that are identified as, as the most vulnerable. Great, thank you. Well, I think we probably have time to answer one more question. Um, a question I don't know if you can answer in a minute. What effect will the changing jet stream and high pressure systems with climate change have on our precipitation here in California? Oh, good question. I will need to read the latest literature to, to be able to give a meaningful answer. So I'd rather skip on that one. OK, no worries. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I just wanted again to uh, thank our wonderful speaker for giving us so much information on this topic. It's so timely. Remind everyone to attend our future lectures in March and April. But if you uh, want to know more about what events are coming up, you can go to actera.org slash subscribe. I'll drop that in the chat. And thank you everyone so much for attending. Um, it's been wonderful to get together and talk about this issue. And I'm so glad that we were able to do it. So thank you so much, um, Pablo, and take care, thank everyone. You, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Aptera. <laughs>